QuickBooks Online 2024 Chart of Accounts. Get ready because we don't just do data input, we get totally into it with Intuit's QuickBooks Online. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are online in our browser searching for QuickBooks Online Test Drive, looking for the result that has Intuit.com in the URL, Intuit being the owner of QuickBooks, selecting the United States version of the software and verifying that we're not a robot. Opening up the major financial statement reports like we do every time. Reports on the left hand side and then in the favorites we're going to right click on the balance sheet open link in a new tab. Right click on the profit and loss open the link in a new tab. Let's go up to that middle tab close up the hamburger there is our balance sheet. I'm going to do a range change bringing us back to 2023. So I'm going to go from 01023 tab 123123 tab running it to refresh it. Tabbing to the right, closing the hamburger, running the date range from 010123 tab 123123 tab run it to refresh it. There's our our financial statements back to the first tab. That's the setup process that we do every time. We want our data input happening in the first tab. I'm going to check the results of that to the financial statements on the tabs to the right. So in prior presentations, we've been talking about the cycles, noting that the entire accounting process is a series of cycles. And then we have cycles within the cycles. And that's the customer cycle, vendor cycle, employee cycle, remembering that these is where you typically go once the setup process has been created and you're you're well into your normal cyclical accounting process. However, if you're setting up a new company file, you have to set up those foundational things, which we said were often named in QuickBooks terminology as lists. And we saw that we can find the chart of accounts being the most important of the lists. So if we hit the drop down and we go into the lists here, we can go into the all lists and that will get us to our chart of accounts here. You'll probably do this a different way. I mean, most people are probably going to use the searches on the left hand side with the chart of accounts, because although the chart of accounts is a fundamental underlying list, we still might be checking it out. Oftentimes we might use it in order to get into the registers. So I think most people will probably go into the list by going to the transaction tabs under the menu. And then you've got your chart of accounts on the right hand side. That's how I tend to go in there uh, most often. Because this is so fundamental, we want to go over the chart of accounts in uh, some detail here. So the chart of accounts is the foundational items that will have the list of accounts that will be then used to create the financial statements so that whenever we do a data input form, such as the forms under the customer vendor or employee cycle, those will create a journal entry in essence, journal entry meaning that at least two accounts on the financial statements will be impacted and, and uh, they will be in balance. So we'll remain in balance in terms of the balance sheet. And so we have to have this chart of accounts fundamentally set up before we can really do anything. Now, when you start a new company file in QuickBooks Online, it'll actually create a default chart of accounts for you automatically. If you're used to the desktop version, note that it's a little bit different with online. With a desktop version, when you tell the system what industry in you are in and the type of business that you have, then QuickBooks will actually make a pretty customized chart of accounts. With the online version, you still have to tell the system, as we will see when we start up a new company file in a future course or section, you have to tell the system, you know, what kind of company you are and are the industry you're in. 
but it doesn't really change the chart of accounts at this point in time. I thought they would have kind of updated that by now, but they haven't really, really customized the different chart of accounts that they give. And therefore, usually they give this really long chart of accounts, no matter what time of business you are in, so that it can basically compensate for all of the different industries and types of business entities. So that means that you're going to start up with probably too many accounts and need to trim it down. So when you, if you start up a new company file, one way you might do it is start the chart of accounts and then possibly trim it down to the ones that you think you're going to need. Or you might start the company file, have a chart of accounts, and then do data input for the first month of operations at least. And you might do that with the bank feeds and create transactions with the bank feeds. And then the idea would be every time you enter a transaction, such as an expense form, for example, which are the most plentiful transactions typically, then you're going to look for and see if there is a an item in the chart of accounts that ties out to what you think uh, it should be going to. So if it's a telephone expense, you see one that says telephone expense and you use that one instead of creating a new account. And if you don't like the name in the chart of accounts, instead of creating a new one, just calling it phone instead of telephone, perhaps, or putting it under utilities, then you're going to go into your chart of accounts and actually modify the chart of accounts so that uh, it, you don't have two accounts that are similar in nature. If you have multiple accounts that are similar in nature, it's likely that you will then record to different accounts for the same items which will kind of be messy. That'll be, that won't be consistent. We want consistency with the accounting. So that's one approach you can do. You could take their chart of accounts, enter the transactions, use the chart of accounts to the best ability that, of the accounts that are there, and then go back into the chart of accounts and uh, adjust the chart of account names if the account is not there uh, that you want. And if there's nothing anywhere near what you want, then and only then did you add a new account. Uh, the last way you might do this if you have especially if you're if you want to customize your chart of accounts a lot and you're possibly using the bank feeds you could try to delete all of the accounts and this is what we might take a look at when we get to the bank feeds section or course where we where you can then remove the chart of accounts and then just add the accounts as you do data input for example as you have the bank feeds and add expense forms you add them as you go and that way you'll be creating your exact own custom chart of accounts as you go. Uh, the reason you have to be careful with that, however, is because if you're not very good at knowing when a, an account type should be an income account, a cost of goods sold, an expense asset account or liability account, then that could be a little bit tricky. So if you don't know like those fundamental account types and some accounting fundamentals, then you might just want to use the chart of account that has been provided would be the general uh, idea. So if we look at the chart of accounts, we have up top, we've got the name of, of the accounts over here. And then and we can we can adjust the filtering by name. If we wanted to right? we can adjust by name if you wanted to search by name. But typically, uh, the default is going to be by the type of account that we have. And and that's going to and or the the detail well the type of the account which is going to be the main uh characteristic of the account so when we think about the actual accounts that we can have the types of accounts you can think about it as in essence the balance sheet on top of the income statement meaning if i look at the balance sheet its most fundamental components are assets liabilities equity and then the income statement is income cost of goods sold if you have inventory and expenses those are the those are the main components and that's what's in the chart of accounts right that's going to be the kind of accounts you have assets liabilities equity and then the income and expense now it gets a little bit more complicated than that however uh, because the, you could have different kind of assets that do basically different things so if i go back into here you could see then we have the top ones listed by the account type. The reason we list it by account type is because that will be in order in essence of assets, liabilities, uh, equity, income and expense balance sheet on top of the income statement. And then within there we have the bank accounts. So if I compare that to the balance sheet here, just note if I kind of expand these as we go under the assets, 
we then have current assets. Current assets is a normal term for reporting purposes, for financial reporting purposes. So that's why they're going to put that there. But then they have another sub account of the bank accounts. That's not normal because normally you would you would just call it cash under normal reporting purposes. So why do they have it? Why do they call it bank accounts here? That's because they have the accounts that are have a special need that have the bank feeds that could be tied to them. So you can see you have a sub group for the bank accounts here. That's these account types right here. So those are going to be your checking account, your savings account in this example. And then you've got the accounts receivable. Again, accounts receivable is really just another current assets, but it has another drop down, which is really kind of weird because then it makes two lines for one accounts receivable. Why do we have why, why is that going on? Well, again, the accounts receivable from an internal uh, software standpoint has special needs to be able to track the customers and uh, on a sub ledger. And therefore, QuickBooks has to give it its own little category here and break it out as something different than other current assets. And then every other kind of asset that we have here, uh, inventory, prepaid, and so on, are just, they don't have any extra special need for QuickBooks, apparently. And therefore, they're going to just simply go into other current assets. So when you think about your assets, then you have the bank accounts as a special account, accounts receivable due to the sub ledger, and then all the other accounts. You would think inventory would have to be broken out special, but I don't think it is, even though it has a sub ledger, uh, because the, the accounts receivable, you have to, they, the system forces the sub ledger to match uh, the accounts receivable by not letting you post to accounts receivable without a customer. And they don't do that with inventory. So, which has its pros and cons. But in any case, then we're going to go down to the fixed assets. This is going to be your, your property, plant, and equipment, the depreciable assets, the large purchases that are made. So we just have a truck under here. And that's going to go under fixed assets. Fixed assets will include both the, the fixed asset accounts, equipment, trucks, so on, and the accumulated depreciation, which will go under this category. Now, this is the first category. Note that we have these indentations here. The indentations uh, represent a sub account. So this is going to help us out with our formatting on the report. So if I look at my reports here, you'll note that we have the trucks and then this sub account. So with these triangles, what do these triangles mean? Well, the asset triangle is a financial account type of, of triangle. It's there automatically. And then the current assets, again, is kind of a financial account triangle that will be there automatically. And these accounts will be there. These triangles will be there depending on the, the type of account. Every account type will have its own triangle. And then you can make your own sub triangle here with the sub accounts. So this is a pretty flexible tool because if you want to order your accounts, for example, if you want to order your accounts, you have to order them by assets, liabilities, equity, because that's just how the financial statements work. But within that, you could further order them possibly with account numbers, because you could see within these two, these two here, then how do I, what if I want the savings account to be above the checking account? Well, I could use account numbers uh, to that, to do that, or, uh, uh, that can get kind of messy in and of itself. We have a section on account numbers. If you want to uh, check that out, a section or course on that looks specifically at account numbers, uh, you can make a sub account. So this will come in uh, also when we get to the expenses where you might want to group your expenses by having basically a sub account, which can help you to group certain expenses in a general area without using the account numbers. So some people get carried away with the sub accounts, by the way, so you don't want to go overboard with them. But here we've got the accounts payable. So now we're on the liability side. So if I go to the balance sheet and we go into the liabilities, we have liabilities and equity. And I'll close up the equity for now. And then under the liabilities, we've got the current liabilities, which is a general kind of category for financial reporting. And then we have the accounts payable, similar to the accounts receivable, has its own like two accounts here and why does it have that because because accounts payable has a sub ledger that needs to be tracked by vendor who we owe the money to 
So once again, it's got its own special category instead of just being other like a current liability. The credit card down here is actually similar to the bank accounts. So it needs its own category because it can connect to the bank feeds, even though it's going to be a liability account. So now we've got the credit cards has its own category because that allows you to connect to the bank feeds for those types of accounts. And then everything else is going to fit into other current liabilities, all the accounts that don't have a special need by QuickBooks to track the subledger or connect to the financials or connect to a bank. And then you've got the long-term liabilities. These are things that are going to be due in a period longer than 30 days. So you have your, your loans uh, might go in there. And then we get down to the equity side. So the equity side down here, we have these opening balance equity, retained earnings, and net income on the balance sheet. Now, here's where it gets kind of confusing uh, when, you, when you think about different types of industries. Because if I was a sole proprietorship, I might call it not retained earnings, but just owner's capital or my capital account or owner's equity itself. Uh, if it was a partnership, then I would need multiple capital accounts for the capital per partner, basically. And only if it was a corporation would you want retained earnings. So it's kind of funny that QuickBooks Online is probably geared more towards small to mid-sized businesses, which many of which might be like some type of corporation, like an S corporation, possibly more likely than many C corporations, possibly. Uh, but it, but it has retained earnings because a lot of the users are probably sole proprietorships and uh, and partnerships. In which case, retained earnings is not exactly the proper term because you would be using basically capital accounts. So the retained earnings account is going to be the account that everything rolls into. So the income statement will roll into retained earnings. So you can't really like delete the retained earnings. You could change the name of the retained earnings to whatever you want it to be, such as the owner's equity or owner's capital or a partnership account. The income account here, notice it doesn't actually have an account on the, on the, on the, on the chart of accounts. That's because this isn't actually an account. This is QuickBooks trying to tie in and show us that the income statement is related to the balance sheet. Meaning if I go to the next year, this will roll into retained earnings doing the closing process basically for us. So if I show you that 010124 to 123124, see this closes out then into the retained earnings. So if it was, an, if it was a sole proprietorship, you might want to re rename the retained earnings to owner's capital account or something like that. And now the net income is ready to start over again for the current year and and then add and then it'll add in here now that retained earn that that net income is kind of good and kind of bad it, it shows you the link but uh if you're a partnership it becomes kind of a problem because in a partnership you're going to have to allocate that net income to the related capital to the related uh capital accounts per partner and so 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 then you're going to have to do like a journal entry but you don't have this account to hit because this is like an account that's not really an account <laughs> So it's kind of messy that way, but we might talk about that more in the future. Let's go back over here now. Uh, you might also have a, a equity account for, for draws, if it was a sole proprietor, for you taking money out of the business. And you might also have uh, an investment equity account. If you're a corporation, you might have a dividends account, which would be like taking money out to the owners in the form of dividends. Then we're on the income statement. So it's the balance sheet on top of the income statement. The income statement over here at its most basic level is just income and expenses. But then we can further break out the types of income and expenses, right? So if I go into the income, this is all the general income. Usually you don't have that many accounts here, but this being a construction company, they have more income accounts than you might see elsewhere. So you can see we have our income accounts. They made a lot of sub accounts. We have sub of sub accounts here. Uh, uh, so they might have gone a little bit overboard on the sub accounts in my opinion, but uh, it can be a useful tool to use those sub accounts. So these are all income accounts. Usually you would only have like a few income accounts for most businesses that weren't like a contractor. Cost of goods sold is just basically a special expense account. And that's the inventory that we are selling. 
because it's such an important expense. If you sell inventory, it has its own sub ledger over here. So that's why it's basically an expense has its own area. Again, because it has its own uh, account type, there's a triangle to it, even if you only have one cost of goods sold account. And then down below that, we've got all of our expenses. So these would be most of the things that you're going to do when you set up a new company file, especially for a small business, because for a small business, you're going to be doing certain things to generate revenue and paying for everything else. So you might be paying it through electronic transfers, you might be recording the bank feeds. And as you record the bank feeds, this is where you're going to record the other side to some kind of expense. In other words, the expense typically has more account types in it than any other uh, category. We have the more variance of types of things that we pay for uh, for our business. So under uh, the expenses, you can see we've got the ad, it's in alphabetical order unless you have account numbers or you can use sub ledgers to kind of break that up. So this is where it becomes most kind of problematic on the expenses. The fact that if we don't have account numbers, then uh, I can't order the accounts the way I want to as easily. However, the account numbers can be a little bit messy to deal with and we could use the sub accounts to help us out with this. So for example, if I had the automobile, they put fuel under automobile. We might also have auto maintenance and, and so on and so forth. And uh, we might put them as sub accounts, which once again, when I go over to my income statement will result in an added triangle, a triangle that's not there due to, due to it have its, having its own account category like expenses but rather because we made a sub account. So the sub accounts can be great, but also note that they, that they add a lot to an extended report, meaning now instead of having one line item, I've got a line item and then a subtotal. So it adds like two extra lines including, and then the account on top of that. But we could print reports where we collapse these line items. And so it gives you some more variance. So again, some people really love uh, the sub accounts and uh, sometimes people sometimes people might over overdo it a little bit to get a little bit more but then we got the bank accounts it's in order insurance has a sub account the job expenses with the sub accounts job materials you could see the sub accounts uh, legal and professional so this is a classic example for many different kind of businesses where you might put the accounting bookkeeping and lawyer for example under legal and professional and then the maintenance, again, the building repairs and so on that you might put under uh, the one account. Now, also, it's interesting to note here, it's useful to note that all of the balance sheet accounts are permanent accounts. So all of, all of the ones up top are permanent and they have a register. So you're probably most used to seeing the register on a checking account, but any balance sheet account has a similar kind of functionality register. So if I go into this register, for example, you have your checking account and you can enter forms in here in a quick method. So this will be a quick data input method to enter the basic kind of forms. If I go into other accounts, it's often the case when you have a situation where you have a journal entry, there's no form that can be used. So you're going to enter a journal entry like the purchase of equipment that you made with a loan or something like that. If I purchased a truck and I financed the entire thing, I might then go into uh, this item here and view the register and then I can see it in terms of increases and decreases. Notice I only have a few options now as opposed to the cash account, the transfer and the journal entry. If I enter a journal entry, I can see it as increases and decreases. Note that that works well if you only have two accounts impacted, but if you have a whole lot of accounts that are impacted, then debits and credits are actually an easier way to see what is happening that's why that's why they use them right but if if you're if you're not comfortable with debits and credits or even if you are it's a little bit easier sometimes possibly to use a register but you have to make sure that you're going to use the balance sheet side of the register so we'll probably test that out a little bit in future presentations if we're doing batch action activities we can batch the entire thing or whatever accounts we want we can make them inactive if we so choose. If you're starting a new company file, for example, and you wanna make them all inactive, then you can do that. You can't really delete them, even though you might not wanna use them, even if you don't have anything in there. 
and QuickBooks Online. In the desktop version, you can delete the account if there's nothing posted to it. But online, I don't believe you can delete any of them, so you can make them inactive with that one. You can search for a particular account. Uh, we have the all accounts or the ones created by you, which is kind of nice because now you can see the difference between the default accounts and the ones that you created. Uh, we've got uh, the batch edit here. Uh, so if you go into this, you can go in here and actually edit a little bit more quickly this might be maybe a lot more quickly this might be something that would be useful if again you started a new company file you got their chart of accounts but you want to go in here and customize your own uh, names of those chart of accounts so i'm going to cancel that we can print them and then in the drop down we've got the columns type detail type quickbooks uh, balance and the bank balance if you want less information to see them a little bit clearer you can remove some of these notice down here what is not included the inactive items so you can't delete them but you can make them inactive if they're inactive they may have had something posted to them in the past so you might want to still look at them at some point in the future and you could still find them by going to uh, the active uh, include active items here also just realize it, it gets a little it's a little you have to get used to the web based system because if I go all the way down you might say uh, there's all the accounts but we could have more on the right so if I keep going if I go to the next one we have more expenses over here so just realize that you have to make sure that you there might be more than one page of the expenses and so these are just going to be more of the accounts of which might be mostly expenses down here they have other income and other expenses if you go to the income statement those show up on the bottom of the income statement and why would you do that well maybe you have an income that's not normal like let's say uh, you get income from like a one-time thing or possibly you have investment income from stocks and bonds that you invest in but that's not our normal business our normal business is in this case landscaping right so then that other income i might want to put it down here so that so that it's not included in my net operating income is generally the idea so i might say hey look i don't want it included in my normal income because it's not what i normally do or if i had some one one time event i don't want to include it up here i want to say hey look there's my operating income from normal operations and then i've got this and then i've got this other thing down here which could be income or an expense expenses are the same way you might have a one-time expense that you're saying hey that was totally weird or unusual i don't expect it to happen in the future i don't want to make projections about it therefore i want to put it on the bottom of the income statement after the subtotal of net operating income so that's the general idea uh, with that one and then of course if i go into any of these accounts and want to edit them i can go into the drop down here i can edit or i can make it inactive and so if i edit we've got our editing options and this window will show how to we'll add more accounts when we start a new company file in a future course or section but it's an expense type of account and then we choose uh, the expense category that we are under we have to choose a tax uh, item which isn't as important because I find that most people aren't connecting directly to a tax software. Uh, I, I haven't seen that to be, I have not, I've yet to seen it work quite really well uh, to like link directly the tax lines to, uh, to the tax software. I've tested it out before. And if I, if they get to the point where I think it's useful, I will, I will test it out. But at the, my testing has shown me that you're going to take the income statement and enter it into the software is like easier most of the time. But in any case, there we have that. I'm going to close this back out. And there's the fundamentals of the chart of accounts. We'll talk more about the chart of accounts a bit when we when we get to the section or course of starting a new company file where we will see this chart of account created from scratch uh, or created by QuickBooks, what their default chart of account is, and then how we can move forward uh, with that default chart of accounts, which you can do. You could just basically say, I'm just going to use that and move forward to the best that we can. And then when we get to the bank feed course or section, I believe we'll actually delete all of the chart of accounts and show you how we can create it from scratch with the bank feeds. 
by going to say the transaction tabs, here's our bank feeds. And then as we go through the checking account area, as we add each of these items, we can then assign our own account that we want to have it assigned to. And if we do that for a couple months, it's tedious for the first couple months, but once we're done, we have our own customized chart of accounts and it won't have all that bloat in it, all that added accounts that we're not using and so on. So sometimes that might actually be easier uh, to do than uh, because then you know exactly, you've, you've built it basically yourself, you know, what's, you know what's going on. But there's pros and cons to that because you have to have some understanding of how the accounts work and account types, asset liability, uh, equity, income, and expense.